Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland, and no, this is not the strange hairstyle I've got, it's part of my hood. Anyway, um, I'm in front of uh, Viscount Grey of Faladon's house in London. You can see it's a very handsome, early 18th century building. This is Queen Anne's Gate, no doubt, as in she was the sovereign when uh, this street was built. So, um, Lord Grey of Faladon was born in 1862 in Northumbria, where the, the Grey family had been one of the most prominent aristocratic families for several generations. Uh, indeed, he was dis distantly related to Earl Grey of the Reform Bill, after whom Earl Grey T is named. So, um, uh, Sir Edward Grey, as he originally was, went to Oxford University because most politicians who rose at the top of the tree have been to one of the two great uh, English uh, universities, and he, he joined the uh, Liberal Party. He was a noted debater and was um, in favour of uh, home rule when it came to that, although he was only just taking his first footsteps in politics when the Prime Minister at the time, William Ewart Gladstone, declared that Ireland ought to have home rule, which is to say autonomy within the United Kingdom. And um, some of the, uh, some of the um, Liberal Party departed, called themselves Liberal Unionists, because they wished to preserve the full union between Ireland and Great Britain. Anyway, um, but uh, Sir Edward stayed with the Liberal Party. And by the 1890s, he's one of the most prominent Liberal politicians in the realm. And the South African War broke out in 1899. And um, he, like most of the Liberal Party, they criticised the Conservative Party for not having done, done more to avert war. However, Grey was seen as one of the moderates within the party, more in the Whig tradition. Um, unlike uh, David Lloyd George, the cottage-bred uh, uh, MP from, from Wales, the solicitor from that part of the world, uh, who was seen as more of a radical and um, almost a quasi-socialist. Uh, so the Liberals came into office in um, 1905 under Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, called an election almost straight away. In early 1906, they um, won by a landslide in terms of seats, not so much in terms of votes, only about six percentage points ahead in a share of the vote. So um, uh, Sir Edward Grey soon became uh, uh, Foreign Secretary. Most countries would be called Foreign Minister and had to handle the relationship with Germany. Now, previously, the United Kingdom was pursued France and, to some extent, Russia as its potential uh, foes. But uh, the United Kingdom had been overtaken by the United States in the 1870s as an industrial country. And uh, in the 1890s, Germany uh, overtook the UK. It became uh, a more industrial country in the United Kingdom with a greater capacity and producing better goods, cheaper goods. So many inventions and scientific innovations coming out of Germany. So the United Kingdom was falling further and further behind. Russia was also breathing down the UK's neck. There was the Anglo-German naval race as Germany expanded her fleet. This Flottenpolitik was based on the risk theory that the United Kingdom could not run the risk of a war against Germany because the German fleet was quite big. The Royal Navy would probably prevail, but the, the UK could not afford to take that chance. And therefore, if you can't beat them, join them. Well, it was a logically flawed policy and it had the opposite effect. But anyway, it was quite possible that war was going to be averted despite some saber-rattling incidents, Austria's annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, or the gunboat tan um, Panther being um, anchored off Morocco, while well, the Kaiser going to Tangier, and all these things which might seem trifling to us these days. And finally, in 1914, a certain Austrian Archduke, Franz Ferdinand, was shot dead in Sarajevo by Gavrilo Princip. Well, the rest is history. And um, Viscount Grey of Faladun, he was there at the cabinet meeting when it looked as though the United Kingdom would remain uh, neutral in the First World War. However, um, uh, the Kaiser ordered that Belgium give his men safe passage or it would be war. And, well, Belgium put the kibosh on the Kaiser. As the Germans, as the Germans were resisted by the Belgians, the United Kingdom decided to declare war under the Treaty of London in 1905. And as Lord Grey said, the lights were going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit in our lifetime again. So then he had this key role of Foreign Secretary at the beginning of the First World War, trying to get as many countries on board the Allied side, trying to uh, manage the tricky relationship with neutral countries, particularly the United States, and persuade America to be the arsenal of democracy, that, that the Allies are fighting for democracy, largely a fallacious claim, since there were a number of autocracies on the United Kingdom's side, and indeed the colonies were run on an authoritarian basis. But that was that. So. Really, liberalism was shattered in the First World War. The notion that uh, 
mankind was, was bettering himself seemed to be largely bogus. I think it was Thomas Hardy who wrote this uh, bitterly sardonic um, epigram, Peace on earth, we sing it, and pay a million priests to bring it. After 2,000 years of gas, uh, of mass, we've got as far as poisoned gas. So man's ingenuity was uh, used to come up with ever more efficient ways to slaughter his brother. And that, that, that poem I just quoted to you was entitled Christmas 1915, where there was not peace on earth or goodwill to all men. Uh, so that was that, and then the, the, the Liberal Party didn't quite split, the Labour Party split, but oddly coming out of that, the Conservatives did better. December 1918, partly because they've been out of office for quite a long time. It was a Conservative-dominated government under Liberal Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Um, he'd ousted um, Henry Herbert Asquith, the Liberal Prime Minister, in December 1916 in a parliamentary coup. I say coup, it was entirely legal and peaceful, just voting him out. But Asquith remained leader of the Liberal Party, even though Lloyd George was, was Prime Minister. So a minority faction of Liberals backing Lloyd George and the majority still supported their official leader, Asquith. And they didn't patch up the relationship for almost 10 years. So they were, they were fatally split. Something the Tory party should remember now. Conservatives were dominant, but Labour came up. There'd been wartime socialism. The state had assumed control over larger aspects of society that was rationing. And remember, the indigent started to eat better in the First World War than they had done beforehand. And these soldiers were fed something like 4,000 calories a day. Now, I know they had to do a lot of things that were physically demanding, but they were better nourished than ever before. And if the state can, can assume control of things for wartime, why not in peacetime to alleviate poverty? So um, liberal values appear to be in the dustbin. Freedom of expression and so on was severely cur curtailed due to wartime exigency um, and so forth. So the liberals didn't, no longer represented an interest, no longer represented a class or a section of the economy like miners or factory owners or shopkeepers or farmers or whatever it might be. That's why um, they were overtaken by Labour as the major party of opposition. And in 1922, um, the, the, um, uh, that they were pushed into third place. And 1923, Labour formed its first government. So he was one of the most prominent figures uh, in the Liberal Party up until his death. But uh, he never served in the cabinet again. That's um, Lord Grey of Faladoon, someone who, who deserves to be better known for um, accomplishing his uh, immensely tricky task of maintaining fairly cordial relationships with uh, neutral countries and indeed the rather fractious allies uh, of the United Kingdom through the Great War for Civilization.